relevant. If it is the authority that they are using against us, challenge the authority, rightly. And all you will then be dealing with when you take away their authority are pirates, are criminals. And whatever decisions they make cannot be sustained, particularly if you have called a court of public record. Their career will be over. And I say to people sometimes when they're thinking about the risks involved, because I understand that the risks that people are threatened with are prison and, and worse and family. But if you fail once in their system, it does not mean the end of the world. But if a judge or a magistrate clearly, openly fails their system, then it can be and should be the end of their career. Don't be convinced by their bluff because the stakes to them are infinitely higher than they are for you. You can learn through appeal. You can learn to live another day. If that judge oversteps their mark and you nail them on these issues and it is on the public record, that can be the end of their career and you don't need to bring it to an end. They themselves must bring it to an end. Because once they lose the law, once they lose the fundamental components and they no longer have the law, then their survival will be measured in weeks. No civilization in history, none, no regime has managed to survive without the cover of law for more than a matter of months. None. Once the law has been taken back, their survival can be measured by an egg timer. Our problem is we have not reached that point yet. Well, let's cover a few more understandings and revelations to share with you in the hope that some of these may again help you in seeing how the system works. And I refer you always, please, if you have the opportunity, please go and read the canons, read positive law, read cognitive law. What I want to share with you now is the meaning of standing, a word that's used many, many times, but I'd have to say is rarely explained in the context. What do they mean by standing? You have no standing. Where does it come from and what law is it related to? Well, Surprise, surprise, the word standing appears through probate. It is a feature of probate law and what is called the surrogate court, and that is the court presided by the executor and his or her trustees in the proving of the validity of a will. And the origin of standing comes from what's called the close of the land and standing on the land. And it relates to an entitlement through a state proven now by statute to will, hence standing. If one does not have an interest in the will being discussed, the estate being discussed before a probate court, one does not have standing. That is the meaning of standing. Now, do beneficiaries have standing? Yes, well, they, they can and they do. A beneficiary has an interest. And in fact, the prosecutor, the pro cutus, the one who is usurping your skin by claiming to be you, under the sacrament of penance by introducing your confession as you is in fact under probate claiming to bring a contest against the estate as a beneficiary. So the prosecutor in the context of court and the court playing out under probate law 
the prosecutor is claiming to be a beneficiary and therefore having standing in relation to your estate. Now, the judge also has standing because the judge is presumed, presuming to be the executor of the constructive trust that is the case and an interest in, therefore, the administration of the estate. And the clerk is, as an agent and an administrator, also having an interest. But when you go to a probate court, unless you have identified yourself as the general executor, the office of general executor, then the executor under their rules, remember probate is their rules, can deny you have standing. And that is exactly what they do. You have no standing in their system, in their courts, because their courts are probate, because they do not recognize your interest. You are merely there as a witness. And then at the end, to perform surety once it's all said and done. But once you stand as the occupant of the office of general executor, you have the highest standing in the court. Not anyone else in that probate court for that trust, for that constructive trust, has a higher standing than you. You are the general exec you are the occupant of the office of general executor. And you can decide the direction of matters competently, hopefully. So standing is important. Yes, it is. But there is no way to gain standing in their system unless you stand as the occupant of the office of general executor. Well, let's move to the next one. And any things I've raised, if there's questions, please, at the end, of this first part of the call, I look forward to your questions and your comments. I want to talk about passport, because we've gone through passport before. There's been a lot of discussion on what passports are, and I don't believe that from a UK perspective we've necessarily nailed it in terms of clarity. You go to the site one-heaven.org and you have a look at positive law, when you go to the end of positive law, you will see a section there talking about birth settlement certificates. For those that have listened to the calls, hopefully will remember that we spoke about, and I believe we made very clear, the origin of birth certificates in the 19th century as having direct provenance from settlement certificates. And settlement certificates being the enclosure of rights and degrading us down to being mere paupers is the original form of what we now conceive to be a passport. You could not travel without a settlement certificate if you were a pauper. You could not settle. You could not visit a city, town or any place if you did not have your settlement certificate, your birth certificate. And indeed, a number of you have shared with me insights that have been gained where it has been admitted that your birth certificate as a settlement certificate is indeed a passport. It is already a passport. So why in the hell do we have a thing now called a passport, if our birth certificate, as originating as a settlement certificate, is in itself a passport of the estate. 
No. The answer is because corporations now have claimed the estate. Banks have now, families have now claimed the estate. And they have their own view on us. They weren't happy that we were merely considered paupers. We are considered property. We are considered less than slaves. Now, when you talk to people, family, friends about this, I know how hard it is. They look at you and they laugh. They say, come on, come on. There is no way that we live under a global system of slavery. They ban slavery. This is a terrible conspiracy. Well, I suggest to you, you sit them down and you ask them some very simple facts based on passports. Number one, have you ever travelled? Yes, I've travelled. And when you leave and when you arrive, what do you go through? Well, I go through customs. Stop there. You go through customs. And what is customs all about? Oh, well, they check my passport and, and uh, you know, make sure I am who I am and, and move through. That's right. They check the manifest. They check the bill of lading to make sure that the goods match the manifest, match the bill of lading, and also ensure that there is some underwriting for the goods in case they're dangerous goods. Customs have only ever dealt with goods. So you've just told me, without even thinking about it, that you go through customs when you travel. That means someone, whoever runs this system, treats you as a good property, a box, a widget, a thing, a slave. Oh, well, okay. Who owns the passport system? Oh, well, the government does. Wrong. The government doesn't own the passport system. It is a private system. It is a cartel. Oh, well, I didn't know that. No, it's a private system. So you have already admitted that you go through customs, that you are a thing, you are a good, and you are travelling across different territory that they claim. Maybe, maybe that will wake them up to the reality that you live in a world where these private families treat you as less than a slave. At least a slave is recognised as a slave. You're recognised as nothing more than a table or a chair, a piece of Lego. That's all you are to them. Well, the passport is our enemy licence to trade in their system. And it's why when you go to a bank and seek to open up a bank account, a number of you have shared the fact that they say, well, we need a passport. The bank doesn't know why, it just says we need it for identification. But in reality, it is your primary identification as, your, as the enemy license to trade. Well, we will have identification for you as members. We already do through the live born record. But it's a sobering point to remind ourselves the significance of what the passport is in their system. It is unmistakable proof that you are less than an animal in their system, less than a slave. You are a chair. You are a table. You are a thing to the private corporations. Why? Because only things, tables, chairs and goods go through customs. Not people. People never went through customs. Well, in the time available, let's go through the last three points for tonight. And I want to talk about common law rights now because you've heard me say before when we speak in terms of common law that thanks to...